Good morning, everybody. You glad to be in the house today? All right, man, me too. Get your Bible out. Let's, uh, let's jump into God's Word. Revelation 21 is where we're going to be today, and we are wrapping up our study of the book of Revelation. Hopefully it's been an encouragement uh, to you. I know it has been to me. Uh, some parts a little hard to digest, but you just try preaching it for eight weeks, okay? <laughs> it's a little bit of a challenge as well, but it's been great. And uh, today we're, we're going to heaven, amen? Anybody excited about heaven here today? All right, man, we're gonna, we're gonna learn about heaven and what heaven is really like. But unfortunately, in our culture, there's a lot of misconceptions about heaven. We got some stuff floating around in our culture. It's not in the Bible, but people kind of say it all the time. And uh, so I just want to get those out on the table early. In fact, I want you to help me with this. Uh, I'm going to give you a little quiz. And if you know the answer, you just shout it out, okay? All right, here we go. Some things that are not in heaven, misconceptions about heaven. Here's the first one. In heaven, we're going to sit around on clouds playing... Harps, all right, yeah, yeah, that's, that's not going to happen. All right, number two, uh, when, when a person goes to heaven, blank greets them at the gate. So how do you guys know this stuff? It's not in the Bible. All right, number three, people turn into blank when they go to heaven. Yeah, angels, not sure where that comes from. All right, here's number four, heaven will be one really long blank service. Worship service. Some of y'all think that sounds a little more like hell than it sounds like heaven. Preaching's never going to stop. All right. Here's the last one. Heaven is for blank people. Good people. That's right. All these are misconceptions about heaven, but what's it really going to be like? What's heaven going to be like when we get there? I mean, it's, it's hard for us to conceive it, but uh, the scripture tells us, in fact, Revelation 21 and 22 is the most information in the Bible in one place about what heaven will be like. It's describing for us the eternal state. That's what theologians call uh, the, the ultimate heaven. And ultimately, the Bible tells us that heaven is our home. Amen. Heaven is our home. And this is where God has called us to be and where we will be with him forever. So what's it going to be like? I want to share with you today uh, six surprising facts about heaven. So if you're taking notes, uh, Get your pen, pen out, paper out, get your iPad fired up. If you want to look at the notes on the iPad, uh, on, the, on the app, you can as well. Six surprising facts about heaven. Here's the first one. Heaven will one day come to earth. Heaven will one day come to earth. Look at Revelation 21, beginning at verse 1. This is the word of God. Amen. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, underline uh, the phrase in verse 1, a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, the word new there uh, doesn't mean new in time, like I got a new, uh, a most recent one but it's a new in kind. It's a fresh a newness. It's something new. Uh, this is the description here, a new heaven and a new, a new earth. And then he goes on to say that the old heaven, the former heaven, former earth has passed away. So what does that exactly mean? That our earth and heavens have passed away. Well, there are lots of different thoughts on this. Uh, two basic camps. One is that some say that what this means is that God is just going to scrap all of heaven, all the, our universe, and all of the earth. He's going to scrap it and start over. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 3, you might make a note of that, 2 Peter 3.10, uh, kind of speaks to this. The heavens will disappear with a roar, uh, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. So some people say, you know, it's just going to be scrapped and he's going to create a new heaven that is new universe and new earth. Others people say, no, no, it's not that he's going to scrap it. He's just going to make it new again. He's going to renew it back to the way it was at the beginning. Uh, people that uh, hold to that point to Acts 3 verse 21, heaven, uh, 
heaven must receive him, that is Jesus, until the time of the restoration of all things, which God spoke about through his holy prophets from the beginning. In other words, uh, God's been talking about this from the beginning, but God's going to restore it. He's not going to scrap it. He's going to restore it. So how do you, how do you reconcile one one verse seems to say he's going to destroy it, and one verse seems like he's going to restore it. How do you reconcile these two things together? Well, one way to think about it is if you go back to 2 Peter 3, when it says he's going to destroy these things, if you go back up a couple of verses, he talks about the flood and that the earth perished under the flood. Now, the earth remained, but it's like the earth as we knew it perished, right? Everything on the earth that we knew perished under the flood. And so many think that that's really what we're getting at here, that the earth remains, but everything about the earth is going to be completely uh, made new again. Uh, John Piper puts it this way, the present earth and heavens will pass away. It does not have to mean that they go out of existence, but may mean that there will be such a change in them that their present condition passes away. I think that's probably the best we can get a hold of it, uh, that everything's going to be new again, a new heaven, a new earth. In fact, uh, it won't be like heaven's up there and we're down here on the earth, but the, the heaven and the earth will come together in this place where God is with us. Something new, a new heaven and a new earth. A second surprising fact uh, about heaven is that you'll be closer to God in heaven than you ever could be on the earth. You'll be closer to God in heaven than you ever could be here on the earth. Look at, look at verse 3, 21 verse 3. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them and they will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. He also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Underlying the phrase in verse 3, it says God's dwelling will be with humanity. This has always been God's heart, right? It's always been God's plan for God to be with us. When you look at Genesis, God was walking with Adam in the cool of the day, walking in fellowship. But sin came to the world and created separation from God. And, but we see glimpses of God dwelling with men throughout the Old Testament. In the tabernacle, God was there with his people. And then, then in the temple, God was present, yet there was a veil that separated men from God. Ultimately, Jesus Christ came, God in the flesh. He tabernacled among us, and we killed him. But in the heavens, uh, we're going to know, in heaven, we're going to see that God will be with his people. Finally, ultimately, we will be with God. No more separation. No more distance. No more sin hindering us. No more looking through a veil dimly. We will know him and he will know us in heaven. And what will that be like? Uh, we'll look, look at verse uh, 5. Uh, verse 4, circle the, the two words, no more. No more. No more what? No more tears. No more grief. No more pain. Think about it. No more diseases. No more cancer. No more dialysis treatments. No more doctor's visits. No more, tre no more treatments. No more scans. No more tests. No more IVs, no more dementia, no more Alzheimer's, no more uh, of any of the diseases that plague us today. None of that will be there anymore. No more physical pain, no more crutches, no more wheelchairs. I remember in, I was in uh, Montreal and went to a big basilica there and they had a whole wall of crutches. And they said, well, all that, you know, years and years ago, there was some priest here that did, did some miracles. And here are all the crutches. And I thought, you know, that's what heaven's going to be like. No more crutches. No more physical pain. No more emotional pain. 
No more divorce. No more wayward children. No more loneliness. No more depression. No more uh, mental illness. None, none of these things that plague us today, all of that will be gone forever. How about this? No more death. No more gravesides. No more funerals. No more caskets. No more eulogies. No more graveside visits. All of that will be gone. No more, he said. Because all these things will be of the previous things. Look, it says the previous things will pass away. Listen, here we are today, and we're enduring these things today. And we're looking forward to the day when these things will be gone. But, but let me just remind you that one day we're going to be on that side. And we're going to be looking back, and we're going to remember back when we had to deal with all that stuff. It is gone forever. No more of that. God's made everything new. Verse five, he said, I'm making everything new. Everything is new. Every confusion is clarified. Every hurt is healed. Every brokenness is restored. Everything is made new again. And then I love verse six. He said, he said it's done. It's done. I mean, you know, God is outside of time, right? He, he's not going, okay, i got to just go ahead and wait a little bit longer. No, no. God's outside of time. And in his mind, it is as sure as what? Done. Say it with me. One, two, three. It's done. It is done. He said it, you can count on it. You can stand on it. You can look forward to it as sure as you're sitting in that seat. It is done. All these things will be gone and you'll be close to God like you never could be here on the earth. Fact number three, not everyone will be in heaven. Not everyone will be in heaven. Look at verse six. Look at the middle of that verse. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life to the one who conquers will inherit these things. And I will be his God. He will be my son but the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexual immorality, or sexually immoral, uh, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is a second death. In 2016, Lifeway did a survey of evangelicals about heaven. 64% of evangelicals said they believed Ultimately, everybody will get to heaven. 64% of evangelicals said everybody's going to get to heaven. Obviously, they're not reading their Bible, right? Because that's even higher than the national average of just the every Joe Schmo American said 60% thought everybody would get to heaven. So they have an even greater anticipation that everyone will get to heaven. Is everybody going to get to heaven? Uh, the answer is no. Well, who is going to be in heaven? Look at it, verse uh, 6 says those who are thirsty, those who are thirsty for God. Jesus said in John 7, anyone who is thirsty may come to me, and anyone who believes in me may come and drink, for the Scripture declares rivers of living water will flow from his heart. So those who are thirsty for God come to Jesus Christ for satisfaction. He also says in verse 7, those who conquer, we saw this in, to the, in the letters of the churches, in every single one of them, he who overcomes, he who conquers, remember? Uh, those who conquer sin, those who conquer the flesh in Jesus Christ uh, will be saved. So those who are saved are those who are in Christ. Who are, who's not going to heaven? Verse 8 is a short little list. But really, Revelation 21, verse 27 seems to summarize it all. You can just write in the margin right next to verse 8, write verse 27. Nothing unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, here's a problem. Is anyone here perfect? Uh, no. H have we all done things that are detestable? We done things that are wrong? Yeah, that's, that's our problem. See, the Bible tells us that we're not just basically good people, that our default destination is get to heaven. If we try hard and we try to be a good person and believe in God, we're going to get there. The Bible does not tell us that. The Bible tells us that we're sinful, 
that we're rebellious and wicked to the core and, and that we, we've sinned against God and only the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross can cleanse us from our sin and make us acceptable to God and to give us a home in heaven. See, heaven is not for good people. Heaven is for forgiven people. It's for people who recognize their sin and recognize how far we are from God and come to faith in Jesus Christ. So not everybody's gonna get to heaven, unfortunately. Heaven is not your default destination. That leads us to number four surprising fact about heaven, and that is that there will be a city in heaven. Do you know that? There's gonna be a city in heaven. Check out verse 10. It says, then he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. And her radiance was like a precious jewel, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And the city had a massive high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels were at the gates. The name of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. And there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And the city wall had 12 foundations and the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb were on the foundations. Now, the city, the capital city of heaven, is going to be the new Jerusalem. All right, anybody ever been to Jerusalem? Raise up your hand if you've been to Jerusalem. All right, some of you have been to Jerusalem. Uh, it's, it's just like any other city, right? It's just kind of a dirty city. Uh, kind of chaotic city. Some places are a little sketchy. You wouldn't want to be there after dark, just like just like Dallas, just like Fort Worth, all right? Well, this is the new Jerusalem. It's not like that. It's not like that. This is the new Jerusalem. And he said, I saw this new Jerusalem like coming down out of heaven and, and coming to the earth. And he said it was like, uh, I mean, here's poor John. He's trying to describe this, you know, in language. He's like, it's like, it was like a, it was like a jasper stone, like a, like a diamond, kind of a clear crystal-like thing refracting the, the light as it came down. I mean, he's, it's like a glorious thing. The glory of God emanating uh, from the very uh, city of God. And he said, this is a place where both Old Testament and New Testament saints live. He mentions Old Testament, right? The, the 12 gates all have the 12 tribes of Israel on them, the representative of Old Testament saints. And then the foundations have the 12 apostles representing the New Testament saints. And so this is a place where all God's people will dwell. Hey, you're going to be there. If you know Jesus Christ, that's going to be your eternal home. All right, think about it. In Matthew 8, verse 11, Jesus said that you will sit down and eat with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can you imagine that? Hey, Abraham, can you pass uh, the pasta, you know? Uh, you know hey, hey, Isaac, can you hand me over the ketchup? I don't know how that's going to work. I have no idea. But I mean, we're going to be there with them together. You're going to have conversations with some of these heroes of the faith. Moses, what was it really like, you know, when the Red Sea parted open? You know, Daniel, did you really go to sleep that night with that lion licking his chops right at you, you know? Uh, David, what was it like, man, when that Goliath guy fell over? I mean, weren't you just charged up? I mean, you're going to have these conversations with people who have gone before you from every era, every time, people that walked with God in their time, and they're going to say, what was it like in 2020? What was that like? I mean, it was crazy flying in an airplane, man. How cool is that? I mean, you're going you're gonna to have all these conversations with people of old. But you're going to have conversations with people that you love and people that you know. You know, one of the things we talked about last week is that uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51 says that when Christ comes, there will be both a resurrection of saints and a rapture of those who are alive at that time. And it says, uh, here's my favorite part. I don't get as fired up about the rapture part as this next part. It says, and we will meet him together in the air. I love that. We're going to meet him together. We're all going to finally be together. 
Some of you have husbands and wives in heaven. Some of you have children in heaven. Some of you have moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas in heaven. And you're going to be with them in heaven. You're going to see them. And let me tell you, when you get to heaven and you look back, this world is going to be just like that long. It's just going to be a speck in comparison to all of eternity that you will have to be with them and to enjoy them and serve with them and worship alongside them in heaven. We're going to be together in heaven, all in, in this holy city, this great city. And, you know, if you go on to read in this chapter, he talks about, you know, the, the pearly gates and the streets of gold and how the dimensions of heaven, all of it is there. But I think it just is summarized in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. that says, no eye is seen, no ear is heard, nor mind can even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. You can't even conceive of it. Am I going to like it? Yes, you're going to like it, all right? Is it going to be really that good? It's going to be even better than what you could possibly imagine. Fact number five, some things on earth now will not be in heaven. There are going to be some things here. They're not going to be there. Look at verse uh, 22, chapter 21, verse 22. I did not see a temple in it. Because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple, the city does not need the sun or moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it and the lamp is its lamb. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never close by day because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations to it can be some things here that are not there. For example, there's no temple, right? You know, in the Jewish mind, if you want to be close to God, you had to get to the temple. That's where God dwells, in the Holy of Holies. And, and so now he's saying, hey, you're not going to have to do that. You're not going to say, oh, we got to be sure, we got to get to the temple because that's where God is. No, no, the Lord is a temple. He is going to be with us. You're like, well, Craig, how's it going to be that we're going to be in different places, yet he's going to be there? I don't know. How cool is that? But it's going to be awesome. He's going to be here with us. And we're not going to have to get to a place to get close to him because he will be with us. Then we will know him. It's not going to be a temple. He mentions here there's, we won't need the sun or the moon. Now, some people have been kind of sad about this. You mean there's not going to be any Texas sunsets in heaven? You know, I, mean, I just love a good sunset, right? Or I just love that big orange moon. Well, you know, it doesn't really say that there's not a sun or moon. It says we won't need it. I don't know. Maybe, God, maybe it'll be five moons. I don't know uh, what it's going to be like. Uh, but God can do whatever he wants. Amen? Uh, but, but we won't need it because God himself will be the light. He said it'll never be night there. You say, well, man, I kind of like it when it's night because I get to rest. Hey, listen, this is a whole different dimension now. Uh, in the biblical mind, night was always equated with evil, with darkness, with vulnerability. The thief comes at night, right? You won't have to worry about that when you're in heaven. There will always be the light of God and us enjoying the light of God in heaven. Another thing that's mentioned here are the nations. Uh, you might look at it, verse 24, the nations. And this kind of leads me to say that I, I really believe there, there will be no racism in heaven. There'll be no prejudice in heaven. No separation of people groups and hate. Uh, so much of what we see today in this world, so much hostility. Uh, because the word nations there is the Greek word ethne, which we get ethnicity from. And so there'll be every ethnic group in heaven. Now listen, uh, that's not anything new. We've seen that in Revelation 5, Revelation 7. Every nation, tribe, language, culture is all going to be in heaven. Man, when we worship God, when we're serving God, we're just going to be the manifold beauty of the variety of God's creation, all worshiping him together as one in heaven. What a joy. You know, this uh, next Sunday, we're going to have our church planters on this platform. You, if you don't want to miss next Sunday, okay? If you're going to skip, don't skip next Sunday, right? 
um, because it's not going to be the same online, all right? Just, just come here, be in the house, and you're going you're gonna to hear their stories. But it's just a taste of what heaven's going to be like. Every nation, every language, every people group worshiping God, glorifying God in heaven. And that leads us to the sixth, sixth uh, surprising fact. You will experience ultimate satisfaction in heaven. Ultimate satisfaction. Look at Revelation 22, verse 1. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the city main street. I love that. And the tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And there will, there will no longer be any curse Underline that. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him. You know, you, you were never going to find satisfaction in this world. Is that true? I mean, you get something new, you want something else new, right? I get a new iPhone, well, then I have, a, have to have a new case, right? And, and then I got to have, you know, like the film thing over the top of it so I don't I don't break it, and then, and then I got to have an iPad to match. I got to have a new computer, and it's like, hey, honey, we're just going to get a new couch. Don't ever believe that. It's never a new couch, <laughs> right? Because then it's a new rug, and then it's a new paint job, then it's a new, let's knock out this wall. I mean, you know, it's just never, because we're never satisfied in this earth. You know, I love what Randy Alcorn says in his book, Seeing the Unseen. He said, we think of what we want, we think what we want is money, sex, drugs, alcohol, a new job, a raise, a doctorate, a spouse, a large screen television, a new car, a, a vacation. What we really want is the person we were made for, Jesus, and the place we were made for, heaven. Nothing less can satisfy us. But in heaven, there's going to be this river running right down Main Street that's a river of life. Remember Jesus told the woman at the well, hey, I got living water I can give you that will satisfy you. It's, it's like running down the river. Is that going to be like, uh, like the river walk, you know, with restaurants on either side? I don't know. Is it going to be like Central Park? Are we going to be kayaking down the river? It would be awesome if we did that. But but we're going to be satisfied in every possible way in our soul and our spirit in heaven. There's going to be this tree of life. Look at it, verse 2. The tree of life will be there. The tree we saw in Genesis. Now here it is in Revelation. This represents relational satisfaction because its leaves bring healing. It, bring, it bears fruit. Any hurt that you've had will be healed. Any disappointment you've experienced will be gone It'll all be healed in heaven. And then it mentions here, just check this out. Look at verse 3. Uh, his servants will worship him. The word worship there, I don't know what your version says. Anybody's version say serve instead of worship. Hands up if your version says serve. All right. Yeah, I think that's a better uh, translation here. It comes from the Greek word latris, which is, means for someone to do a task for another to serve. And I believe this really allows us a little window into our own imagination that we're going to be serving God in heaven. You're not going to just be floating around on a cloud or heaven's not going to be like an eternal Sunday nap, all right? You're going to be busy. You're going to be serving God in heaven. And just think about it. You're still going to be you. You're still going to have your same gifts and talents and interests and abilities, except you're just going to be unfettered by sin, and so you're going to be you the way you were perfectly made to be you. So just think about that. If you're an artist, just think what you're going to be able to create when your mind is released from the curse of sin. If you're an architect, just think what you can conceive and build. If you're a musician, just think what the worst. You're going to be able to strike that note every single time, right? If you're a leader, just think how you can lead and cast vision and arrange when you're doing it completely filled with the Spirit of God. That's what it's going to be like. You're going to be serving God in heaven. 
Listen, you're going to have ultimate satisfaction. Satisfaction in your soul, satisfaction in your relationships, satisfaction in your purpose. It all is in heaven. So you see, heaven's not anything really like those misconceptions. It's so much better. Warren Wearsby, uh, he said, heaven is more than a destination. It's a motivation. <laughs> I like that. You know, heaven should motivate us in how we live. Almost every hymn's got at least the third stanza or the fourth stanza that's a heaven stanza, right? We should be singing and thinking and encouraging each other about heaven. How should it motivate us? Well, one, it should motivate us to love God. We should love God more the more we read about heaven. Revelation uh, 22 verse 7 says, Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. To keep it means to let it get a hold of your heart. Hey, have you ever been homesick before? Ever been like in a, in a hotel room for a couple of weeks and you're tired of eating out and you're tired of sitting in the hotel room by yourself? You just can't wait to be home. Maybe you're in a dorm room. You can't wait for mom to do your laundry. Right, mom? And, and, and you're like, man, I just want to be home. He said, the more you allow these words to sink into your heart, the more homesick you get for heaven, for the people that are there, our Savior that's there, all the good things that God's prepared for us. It should stir up our heart to love him more. Also, it should motivate us to share the gospel. In Revelation 22, verse 10, he said, then he said to me, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. He told Daniel, Daniel, you need to seal up the, this scene of heaven I've given you. But to John, he said, don't seal it up because the time's coming. So we need, to be, we need to be sharing our hope of heaven. When people see us grieve, but we don't grieve like those who have no hope, we can explain where our hope comes from. Our hope is in Jesus, who has prepared a place for us in heaven. Now's the time to have those spiritual conversations. Now's the time to talk about the hope we have in Christ. But then I love how uh, it ends, Revelation 22, look at verse 17. Both the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. The invitation, come. Come, God's prepared this for you. If you're thirsty for forgiveness, if you're thirsty for newness, if you're thirsty for healing, if you're thirsty for life, come. Come to Jesus Christ. This is where you find it. You know, my, uh, I remember when Liz's grandmother passed away, she had pretty much raised Liz from, as a little girl and she was now on her last few moments on this earth. I remember pulling up a seat right next to her bed. And I said, Granny, I said, are you afraid of dying? And she looked at me and her facial expression was one like I had said something very odd. And she said, no. She said, I can't wait to be with Jesus. I said, are you like that? I can't wait to be with Jesus, to be in heaven. Have you accepted that invitation? 